I'll see if I can help see if you know. can see if she can come in now. I don't know what it was doing before, because I, I did the same thing I did before. Uh, Charlotte and Marshall and Nat and okay. Banjo are here. Not mother. Try to name Cheryl, but he's got Marshall and them now. Hey, I got a letter from Marshall and her email. Hang on a second. Okay. Hey, um, so um, I, this is Annette. I had to go back to the very first email and use that link. I experienced some problems getting on with the last link. So I okay, the one I sent today didn't work as well, huh? No, That's sir. That's interesting. I don't know if anyone it was the else. Same one. Yeah. I can see it here somewhere, but the audio. Uh, You should be able to join the video. Okay, are you there, Charlotte? I'm here. Your picture's showing. I'm here. All right, there she is. <laughs> um, what about Marshall? Yes, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Marshall's there. And Banjo, I can see your picture. You can see it. I'm here. Okay, he's here. Cheryl hasn't come in yet. <laughs> well, I sure am sorry, but I'll, I'll let you all know about my first introduction to computers again. If you have never heard my story. I was in high school and the math club that I belonged to went to the IBM office in Dallas, Texas. We're talking about mid 1950s. Oh yes, in the, in the I, IBM had computers. So they take us into their office and they, they show us these big computers. And then the new technology was, was on tapes. So after they'd shown us around that, they took us upstairs to one of the older computers. The first iteration of the computers were uh, uh, used cards of various kinds. And you'd punch cards and you'd sort. And so he grabs this stack of cards and he puts them in the machine and he says, we're gonna, we're gonna separate these cards into uh, ages at 10 year groups. The, they're all adults. So the, 20s to 30 to 30 to 40. And so five or six or seven stacks came out. And he grabbed up one of the bigger stacks and he said, now we're gonna sort these by sexes. He put the thing in and it threw out three stacks. Um, I have never trusted computers since. <laughs> uh, okay. Those that are here are here. Um, let's uh, dive in and see. Um, we've had uh, one uh, look at the Lagos uh, system. Uh, anybody look at any of the other uh, computer programs? I did not go to the computer program, but I went home and got all my Bible studies with Bible out. Okay. My study Bible, every man's Bible, life application Bible. Yes, very good. Yeah. That'll keep you, that's, that's a five year, six year cycle you can work your way through. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody on, on the um, internet uh, see any of these? Have a chance to look at any of these? Uh, did you pick a study Bible? Did you already have a study Bible? Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, let me get back to my notes. So I kind of have to stay on track here. Let's see. We've got uh, Marshall's here, Annette's here. Um, Cheryl is probably going to be on the and the Charlotte, that's who I didn't have. And okay, um, as we get into this class, uh, we're going to be um, introducing ourselves to um, a variety of books and uh, on every uh, approach and topic, there's a number of books that have been written. There's not hardly anything in biblical studies in uh, the last couple hundred years that uh, has only been one book written about. Uh, everybody has done different things with the same topic. And so you're faced with a whole variety of uh, books. Uh, and so one of the things that I sent you is a uh, bibliography. And now I don't want to show mine on here. Well, why is it not showing them? other books. There's the libraries. Okay, maybe it'll do it this way. That's not the one we want. Well, maybe that's the reason why it wouldn't show. It, it has closed on me for some reason. There we go. Here's a um, bibliography, the first part of which are simply books about books. And I'll send you this. I sent you this list earlier and I can print it out for anybody who needs to. Uh, and so you have this annotated guide to biblical resources for ministry. And all it is, is a list of books about Bible and ministry in the church. And so you'll have a section about the Bible encyclopedias, about the Bible atlases, about the Bible commentaries on every book, about whole books, about Old Testament, New Testament, and they'll give you a list of four or five or six books that fit this category. And in this one, they have a paragraph that describes the basic nature. Was this written for pastors or for Sunday school teachers, or, or was this written for PhD students in seminaries, and that kind of stuff. So you have some idea about what the nature of this book is. Um, and uh, some of these, uh, like the classic Bible study library, um, is a really old book. Uh, and uh, uh, something like this um, would be worth looking at if you decided you wanted to study the Book of Mark. Well, what are some of the commentaries about the Book of Mark that are fairly good? Or you, as one of our topics is gonna to be, one of the larger 
uh, topical ways of looking at things in the Bible is about customs. Well, I'd like to see about uh, how people lived in the Old Testament. What are some books written about how people live? And one of these books would have that list. Now, obviously one of the problems with this is they're not gonna list the book that got printed after <laughs> their bibliography got printed. And so you're constantly gonna be uh, running behind in terms of more recent publications. Um, so the value of owning one of these, especially if it was fairly expensive, 15, we're talking about most of these are 15, $20 at the most, several of them are less, and a couple of them you can only get as used books because they're old. They're not even publishing them anymore. Um, and most of this stuff you probably could find in a, in a used book situation through Amazon. Another one you might want to write down is Powell Books, and it's an Oregon operation, and it's a huge used book. Uh, they sell new books too, but their big thing is used books. Powell's Books, P-O-W-E-L-L-S. Um, and uh, between them and Amazon, you can usually find nearly all these books inexpensively. And you realize, of course, with Amazon, when you go to used books, they're nearly always just a link to somebody else who has the book. You're really ordering it from somebody else. Amazon's just feeding you their information. Uh, and obviously, if you're at all comfortable with computers, then a good way to bypass this would be simply to Google uh, reviews on commentaries of Mark or commentaries of Joshua or whatever it is you want to Bible dictionaries and you'll get three or four people who have reviewed those things and given you their choice and some explanations about it. You can do that with study Bibles, for instance. One of the things that I printed out or sent to you for last week was some lady who's put together her list of the 10 best study Bibles for 2021. Um, and it's her opinion and so what it's worth. But you, you go to two or three different sites that have reviewed books on this particular topic and you can see the book that ends up in all three lists and you got a pretty good idea that that one's fairly highly thought of and would be worth looking into. Uh, and then the bottom part of this bibliography is a list of most of them are little books about how to study the Bible, uh, different approaches, different techniques, uh, this building blocks uh, has a pretty good discussion about the very thing we're gonna be doing in this class. What are the basic books you need to be able to do this kind of thing? Uh, the independent Bible study is a particular inductive approach to studying the Bible. And he discusses it and then he walks you through several examples of that kind of thing. Uh, there, and uh, if you're serious about developing a, some abilities and some habit in studying Bibles, getting one or two of these little things, uh, reading through them, trying their methods are available. Uh, so this list I've given you. Now, the other thing is, what do you do Here's in the Dallas in the Houston area are all the places these books are. And I've, I sent you this list. Um, it's amazing. Unfortunately, most of these establishments are not on our side of town. So you got to drive a little distance. The closest to us, um, Houston, University of Houston and Rice University and St. Thomas, are not that far. They're right on the other side of the medical center. Uh, so they're pretty easy to get to. 
Unfortunately, Southern Baptist Seminary closed their seminary that was on our side of town over here on Broadway for several years. And then they moved into Sagemont and then they closed it. Um, partly because they were having to cut back and partly because Houston Baptist University opened the seminary on their campus. So there really wasn't much point in having two Baptist seminaries in the same town. Uh, but, uh, yeah. No. Guess the laws and stuff and things, but he was on there for a long time. But um, he and I went to school together, and I do know this when we were like going in fourth grade in elementary school and then give us chess, he would always like third, fourth, fifth, third grade, college level, <laughs> and we were like first grade level, and he was like, well, anyway, of course, he got a doctorate theology and all that, he was on television and all that, so, but he did, he was part of that, and, uh, but I know that um, he didn't live in this area anymore. Yeah. I, I, I knew that they had gone out, but I didn't know that they had gone over by Sage Month. Yeah, they, they, they sold the property completely. The church had already left, so the, the seminary had the property, much more property than they had any need for, so they sold it. And Sagemont invited them to come down and use their facility. But I don't think they were there more than two years and maybe just one. The building is still there, but yeah. nobody's, nobody's, in the nobody's in the major part. Now there may be one of the ethnic groups that's still meeting in one of those earlier sanctuaries. Yeah. That may be still being used, I'm not sure. But the major buildings have not been used in a couple of years. Uh, Yeah. Uh, in addition to these major universities, all of which have serious Bible departments, um, University of Houston has a huge Bible section. Rice University has a graduate program in religion. And so they have a very large collection of books. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. St. Thomas, of course, has a, a marvelous uh, library system. And the last I checked, uh, COVID, of course, has messed everybody up. But the pre COVID, and I assume when COVID's over, uh, the, the most you had to do to be to go into any of these libraries and, and, and sit and read for as long as you wanted to. Um, pay the book to the copy machine and copy pages from it was sign in and show your driver's license or something. Uh, and uh, most of these probably have, a, have a, a small fee, and I don't know what small might mean now, that you could pay on an annual basis that allows you to be a member of the library. And so you can check out books and take them on. Uh, the city county libraries, um, many of them have a fairly good reference section that has all the basic materials that we're gonna deal with uh, most of the time uh, that you can get to. And then there's other schools in the area. Um, and you'll have this list. Uh, anything that you would be interested in, uh, you can find that you want to pursue. One of the marvelous libraries in, in, in town is this Lanier Theological Library. It's a private library built by this wealthy Houston attorney. Uh, you can go to it. Um, and you know, you can go visit and go in. You can become a member uh, for almost nothing. So you can actually check out books uh, unfortunately for us, it's way out on the northwest side of town, uh, but it's there. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, if you happen to live on the west, north of the west side of town, it may not be very far from it. Uh, so there's not going to be a single solitary book, or set of books that we're going to talk about that's not in these libraries. So uh, when we when talk about a ways for you to go behind the English words and go to the Hebrew and the Greek words, all of the major technical stuff that's there, their their libraries, and there's ways we're gonna I'm gonna show you ways that you don't know a lick of that language. You can go look up the articles in those books and read the latest research that's out there on this word or that word in the Bible. Uh, the commentaries are there by the shelves, uh, so you don't have to buy a lot of stuff. It's there for you to use. Now, in addition to that, even before you go looking there, look around where you are. Is the preacher in your church a very studious guy? What kind of library does he have? He may not have it at the church building. I have had a couple of preacher friends who had significant libraries, took up their whole basement at home. Uh, so when you went to their office, you didn't see anything, but that's not what they had. Uh, in my early years here, when we started this church 50 plus years ago, um, I didn't have a very big library. And so when I wanted to study one of the books that I only had one or two on, I went around to my preacher friends in the area and said, uh, what commentaries on uh, this book you got in your library? Are you using it right now? Could I borrow it for a few weeks? And I'd borrow his book. And I'd collect two or three of them from guys around here and add to the one or two I had. And I had a fairly representative section of material to work with. Uh, so look around, acquaint yourself with what's there. The reality is, of course, that every church ought to have a basic Bible library that their people know about, that they're willing to teach you how to use so that you could do this. Um, there was a trend several years ago to really do that, but it didn't go very far. And of course, now in the age of internet, there are not very many churches interested in putting out that kind of effort but it still may be there. And this material may be there. It may not be your church. It may be the one down the street or on the backside of your neighborhood. So uh, look them over. Okay, tonight we wanna start with the basic element of Bible study, which is words. How do you study the words? How do you look at the words? And there's several different aspects of that that you have to work with. The, the most fundamental one, of course, is what did these words mean when they were used in the Bible originally? And that, of course, is not something that you can go directly to because you don't know Hebrew or Greek. So we're going to figure out ways to get back to those Greek and Hebrew words and to those dictionaries, they frequently call them lexicons when it deals with those languages, but it's just the dictionary, um, about the meaning of the word and the way scholars have come to understand it was used in the biblical times. What were the words? That same kind of thing you really need to do with the English words that you're dealing with in your English Bible. Go do some research on some ordinary English library, not English dictionaries, but some ones that deal with words in depth. Uh, tells you about the origin of the English word and, and how it's been used. So you're, you're looking at the basic definition of the word. But a second thing is, well, how did the Bible writers use the word? And to do that, 
you uh, use a concordance. Well, where did it go? That's not what I wanted. What I wanted was this one. Now, did it come up on the screen for you guys to see? Main concordance? It, for you, it did. Did it come up for anybody online? Can you all see it? Or are you seeing just me still? I see a spreadsheet. Okay, you see a spreadsheet yeah. and it didn't do it. So let me hit that and go back this way and see if I can bring it up again. There it is, now it'll come up. There you go. This is called a concordance. And all a concordance does is list every single time a word was used in the Bible. And you have the Bible reference, and then you have the phrase in which that word was used. And you have every single occurrence of it. So here we have the word righteous and righteousness. I can go to the concordance and I can see every time all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. I can go look that verse up. I can go look up all these verses and I can see how the writer used this word. And you're dealing with multiple writers and multiple books. Do the Bible writers do something special with this word? Now, in the technical studies that you're going to eventually learn how to get to, they may even tell you this. Sometimes they don't. You can find it out here. In 1935, a, a significant Bible scholar in England, um, for some reason got interested in the word preach in the New Testament. And he was invited to do a major lecture at some affair. And so he did this three lectures on apostolic preaching. And all he did was go to his concordance of course, he did it with a Greek concordance because he can read Greek. And he looked up all the times a New Testament writer used, and in this case, it happens to be there's two Greek words that get translated preach. He looked up all the instances in which those words occurred. Um, let's see if I can do that and show you what it looks like to a little degree in English. Um, here we go. Now, I can, with, with my Bible program, you see, I can cheat. And I can tell it, I want to search the Bible word, the Bible for the word preach. And actually, because of the way these little programs work, I can tell it I want that word in all of its forms. Preach, preaching, preacher, preaches. And I want to do this in the King James, but I could do it in any, any of these. And I would find out something different. Uh, and I want to find this in... Matthew, this system, this you'd simply use with your program. This is the cheat program. Uh, Matthew 1, 1 to Revelation 22.
And here it is. Let's get rid of this. Well, I'm not going to be able to. Let me get rid of that so I can pull this down. And then I'll get rid of this one. Now let's get rid of this one. And we can see all the times the word preaching occurs in the text. Now he concluded from this simple little study two fascinating truths that weren't then in the 30s and to this day are still not commonly recognized. First thing he discovered is that the words preach were never used in the context of the church and its meetings and activities. The words preach were only used in evangelistic context where the audience was mainly unbelievers. The apostles and their immediate followers never preached to the church, let alone to the choir. They only preached to unbelievers. Preaching was their words for evangelizing. In fact, as we'll see next week, uh, one of the words is our word evangelize. That's where we get our word. Is one of those two words that gets translated preach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they see, we see preaching as different. From, you know, we see preaching in the modern church setting entirely differently. We use it entirely differently. In fact, when I started out preaching uh, in churches like this one, uh, they were deaf on the word, on the use of uh, pastor as the leader in the church. And so they frequently called us preacher. That was our title. And we're ex when we were expected every Sunday to preach. Sunday morning and Sunday night. And some people saw that as fundamentally an evangelistic context. Now, we frequently evangelized with doctrine. And so we didn't understand evangelism adequately either. But that was, that was still the focus. The other fascinating thing he discovered was that when he looked at their preaching, it was overwhelmingly presentation of the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't dwell on the death, let alone the suffering or the blood of Jesus. They focused on the resurrection of Jesus. And to get a taste of that, just look at the very first sermon that we have in the book of Acts, Acts chapter two. One verse, this man approved of God among you and you killed. Whole rest of the sermon is God raising from the dead. We're witnesses of that. David prophesied about it. And the resurrection shows that he's Lord and Messiah. In Acts 17, the first sermon that we have recorded to a non-Christian, to a non-Jew. Paul only says one thing about Jesus. Well, two. He was appointed to be the judge and God demonstrated his, the appointment of this man to be the judge by raising him from the dead. And so this guy becomes famous with this little book. And all he did was look at the way the Bible writers 
used to work. Now, what's intriguing to me is that several years ago, I was in a class where the teacher decided to use that book as the text for this very short term class about preaching. And when I read the book, I thought, I've heard that before somewhere. And fortunately, before the class was over and I had to write a paper for it, I discovered the book that I had seen it in and it gave me the resources in some journals in the early 1800s where there were several articles about people with, by people who had done exactly the same thing. They'd just gone to their concordance and they weren't even Greek scholars and looked to see how the Bible writers used this word. Now, the reality is, there's a lot of words like that in the Bible. Some you wouldn't expect. So, for next week, I'm going to let you pick a word and see what you can find out. Now, if you pick a word like love or faith, you're probably going to have a thousand article, a thousand verses you're going to have to look at. So I don't know that I'd want to do that, but you might look to see about a particular writer. For instance, just as a clue, there is there are several commentators who argue that our usual explanation about that conversation between Jesus and Peter in John 21, Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, Lord, I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Now, now Peter, do you really love me? And because John uses two different words that get translated the same into English, people make a big deal over that. Well, there are several commentators that say, go back and look at how John uses these two words and prove to me that it's anything more than literary. He just wants a little variety. He's not make it, trying to make an issue over which word was being used. Uh, throw you another curve, another word to look at, which doesn't have that. that. Uh, several years ago, I was doing a Bible study in a Wednesday night Bible study in the church. Uh, and we were, that lesson on was on Luke 13. And that's the chapter where uh, uh, the only thing I don't like about this program is it's hard to find these texts. Uh, the, when you do this in uh, the, this online program in Mac, if you had a Mac, it's an absolute jewel. Uh, because you can go immediately from one book to the other and immediately uh, from one chapter to another. And I never have understood why they did this. Uh, this is the story where uh, the Galileans that uh, Pilate mingled with the sacrifices of their blood, uh, were they sinners above all the Galileans? Uh, the 18 of, uh, killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, were they worse sinners? No. But I tell you, unless you repent, you'll perish. I don't remember now what the count is for how many times in that little paragraph, Jesus uses the word repent. You must repent. Unless you repent, you're going to die. And I don't know how I developed what I talked about, emphasized how much I went on to the rest of the chapter or the next a few paragraphs or whatever. But anyway, when the lesson was over, this man in his 30s who's recovering his faith, he grew up in the church and then drifted away and now he's come back, asks the obvious question that it wouldn't have, didn't occur to any of us to ask because we were all Christians. We'd long been Christians. We knew the Bible. We knew what, you know, everything about it. No, no big deal. And he asked the obvious question. It looks like repentance is pretty important. 
maybe life and death. So, what am I supposed to repent of? I'm supposed to repent. What am I supposed to repent of? Yeah, but why doesn't Jesus tell us what to repent of? He says you got to repent, but he doesn't say what of. Which required me to say, hey, what's going on here? Word study. And if you do the word study on repent, you will find that only once in the book of Acts, until you get to the book of Revelation, do you ever have repent of. John, Peter, Paul, Jesus only say Repent. What's going on if they can say repent and not say repent of? We need to take a closer look at the word repent. Something was going on in what they meant when they used that word because they didn't say repent of. What is it? So now you have to dig into the word. Now you have to look into the word. And unfortunately, the way the Bible writers use it, the verses in which they report it, don't give you a whole lot of clues. So then you have to revert to these other sources that go deeper because they've studied the word as it's used in the first century, as it was used in Judaism. And pretty quickly, you come up with a significantly important different view of repentance. There's a fascinating controversy that arises in ancient Israel when Ezra and Nehemiah rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple. And they have a variety of opponents, people who don't like the way things, they're doing things. And some of them are obviously active rebels. They are themselves against. But among them are some people simply called the people of the land. And they're, they're not on the side of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's an interesting the passages in the Old Testament. Who are the people of the land? You look it up. <laughs> you come away totally mystified because in the early parts of the Old Testament, as we have it, the Torah and the history, early history, the people of the land are the good guys. <laughs> in Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they're the bad guys. And you discover that just by doing a little word study on the phrase people of the land. And you see that in these cases, these are not the good guys, but in these cases, they are. Yeah, except it's Bible writers in both cases, they're using the term. And you're right, you see, it may be the change in Israel as to who are you know, no. but the, you come to that from just a simple little 
word study. Yeah. Uh, fourth one, just to prick your information. Uh, isn't the word righteous, pretty strong word about being right with God, being holy, being sinless, being pious? Aren't we supposed to be righteous? Uh, doesn't the writer talk about the fact that we aren't? There's none righteous, no, not one. Doesn't the prophet talk about our righteousness just being like dirty rags? So how does David have the audacity to ask God to judge him on his righteousness, not God's, on his, oh, he, uh, David's righteousness. And he's willing to be judged on the basis of his righteousness. It's an interesting word study. The righteous judgment of God is a pretty fearsome thing, isn't it? Isn't that how we understand it? So how does the writer of Psalms and Isaiah use righteousness in parallel with salvation. God's righteousness and God's salvation are in parallel. Calls for a word study. How are the writers using this word? And you want to confuse the issue even more. How is it that the poor end up to be righteous just because they're poor? Especially when everybody knows that people are poor just because they're lazy. So how can the Bible writers consider them righteous? Calls for a word study. Now, as I said, concordance, you can do that with a paper and pencil and the concordance. I did it for 40 years. And I took voluminous notes and I looked up lots of words. And when you're doing it, you have to remember that you're having to do this and critical thinking and imagination. What's going on as to why the writers use this word this way. Uh, there's an infinite number of words that have significant color that only comes through when you see how they use it and or what that word meant, how it was used in the original language. One of the ones that bugs me the most is the word godliness. Important word in the New Testament, wouldn't you think? But it turns out that the noun godliness is not the noun for godly, the adjective. Aren't the same at all. As we'll see when I show you how to do this, uh, there are two different words in the original. They're not related at all. And biblical godliness is not a matter of being like God. In a fascinating way, it far more tends to how do you like God? not how you are like him. And that you discover when you go to the word study 
and then go behind the English word to the original word. Um, and to a great degree, you see, studying the words is a, is a habit that you, you have to cultivate, almost create, because we're far more prone, especially after we've been Christians for a long time, just to take the words. And so when we read them, it rarely occurs to us to question, why this word in this sentence? What does this word mean here? Why are these two words together? And what does it mean if these two words are together? For instance, like godliness and righteousness. If godliness is a matter of being God-like, godly, then what's the difference between godliness and righteousness? And why would you use the two words together, same phrase, as though there was some different meaning or color to them, You're just being redundant? Maybe so. You know, that's something you have to consider. But you need to develop the habit of occasionally pausing to ask the question. Is there anything special about this word that the translation doesn't show? Is there anything special about this word that I ought to pause and ponder. And then you go do the word study. Then you go look up in the Bible dictionary what that word is, what that word was in its day. And there are all kinds of gems sitting there. Some of which are, could be important when like repent. It's not repent of, what is it? <laughs> and Jesus seemed to think that was pretty important. So uh, pick one of those words. And the first step we're going to do is simply see what we find in our English Bible, that word. And then the next week, we'll go behind that word into the Greek or the Hebrew and see if maybe there are different words translated that way or different places that the word was used that might shed some light on this word. And then the next week, we'll go behind that to those dictionaries. What have all these Bible scholars over the centuries come to understand about this word that's not apparent at all in our English language? So, there's where you're going to go. And uh, we even have a minute or two. Uh, the uh, particular group of churches that SHBI came out of and is related to, that this church, Berean, is related to, um, had some um, great discussions, controversies, conflicts over worship. And the modern church the last 25 years has had a great deal of controversy over worship. Did anybody go to the Bible to see how the Bible writers use the word or words worship? What is worship to them? 
And if you believe this is divinely inspired, what does that tell you about what God thinks real worship is? There again, you see, you don't have a minor issue. You have Jesus saying, the time is coming where you're not going to worship in that temple or on that mountain. But because God is spirit, he's going to have to be worshiped in spirit and in truth. Okay, so what is the truth about worship? In the New Testament. Not in our current experience. Not in the 2000 historical experience of the church. In the New Testament. No, that's, that's related, but how do you do that? How do you worship him? Well, do the New Testament writers ever call prayer worship? Do they ever call singing worship? Do they ever call preaching worship? Do they ever call teaching worship? Do they ever call the Lord's Supper worship? Do they ever call the gathering of the Christians worship? And what do they call worship? Do they ever use the words, the word? And if so, when do they use it? And what do they refer to when they use it? Simple. Bible study, word study of the word. It can become complicated because it turns out we translated several different Greek words, worship in the New Testament. And so now you have to look up all those words and where they get used, however they get translated. And then you have to consider when they use this word in the places where we don't translate it worship, did they understand it to be worship? Even though we don't. For instance, in this word, or preach. If you go down through this word study, you get to this verse here in uh, Acts 17, I think it is. No, 20. Acts 20. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, our Bible say. Didn't I just tell you this Bible scholar made this point that preaching was never done to the church in the church? So how was it done here? And of course, it turns out he was a Bible scholar and he knew that this was not the words, one of the words for preach. For us English people, 16th century, 17th century, what Paul did in the church meeting would have been preached, because that's what we do. But that's not what the writer said Paul did. They didn't word use one of their preach words there. Turns out the word they used is the word we use. We develop our word dialogue. Paul discussed with them. Of course, changes the context entirely, changes the experience entirely. But you see, an ordinary English reader would never guess that until you did the word study. And when you did the word study, you'd quickly see that. You'd see the same thing that this scholar found was quicker for him because he could use his Greek Bible and his Greek concordance and man he was done but we have to do a little bit extra work but not much and in this case you see i'm using this cheap bible study program you can get the whole disc for this and books 
and nearly all these Bibles that I've given here, I had to pay for a couple of these, 10 or 15 bucks for the right to use it. Um, I've got maybe 45, I've got less than $100 in this Bible program. This is the online Bible. Online Bible. Online Bible. The online Bible. Online Bible. Yeah. And it's a much better program than for uh, Macs, if you have a Mac, but uh, online Bible. Uh, let's see if I can take this one down for a second and bring up, I think I saw, uh, well, now it's not showing. Concordance Online Bible. Uh, this one, maybe if I bring this up and then it'll do it for me. If I do it again. Here is uh, the uh, olive tree program. It doesn't cost any more than the online Bible does. I haven't used it as much, so I'm not as uh, uh, comfortable with it. Now let me close this again and see if I can bring it up for the good folks online here. No, it's not going to do it. Well, maybe if I go this way. No, nope, it's going to take me back to here. Uh, and uh, they're, they're more serious. The, the olive tree is a more serious Bible study program for us because they're uh, building a bigger library of current literature that you can get. Um, a modern Bible dictionary and some of those kind of things you can get in the olive tree thing that you can't get. Uh, most of the stuff in the online Bible program is still old stuff. Although there's a couple of new things that I got uh, But this is a pretty inexpensive program. You can actually download it free with several of these Bibles, the authorized version and a couple of the others, and use it for, for absolutely free. Uh, but if you want the kind of things that I have here, for instance, uh, here's all the Bibles I have, all these different translations. Most of these were free. There was three of them I had to pay for because I wanted them and they're copyrighted. And so they had to pay for them to be able to make them available to the reader. Uh, but it was like 15 bucks that I paid for the right to unlock it and put it on my computer. And this is on my computer. So I don't have to be online, use it. I can use it anywhere I want to. And the one I showed, the second one I showed you, was this is an online Bible, and uh, Olive Tree looks like this. And because I haven't developed it as much, but you can get multiple volume translations to put on it too, so you can have multiple windows and all that kind of stuff. Uh, just like I have on the other one. I don't know why this doesn't come up to show online, but it doesn't. Uh, and uh, I don't think this was letting me bring up for some reason Logos either although I had Logos up uh, and you can see, see here I have a whole string of Bibles uh, um this one I did the preach Bible search program. I just wanted to see what are the texts in Bible and did the same thing that I had in the online Bible. He gave me the list of all the places in the New Testament where the word preach in any one of its forms shows. And I've been dealing with this for 10 years. So the amount of money I have in this has been spread over a decade. 
uh, and now I have nearly 4,000 volumes in this. Um, that's, this is the fifth time, I think. So it's nearly 15 years. Uh, I think this is, the, this is the fifth time that I've done this class. Uh, and I still got to figure out why. Because earlier, all these things were showing. Oh, my, everything I had open was showing. And now it's not. I don't know why. Uh, and there was, a, there was a, a place that said, maybe this is it. No. Position of the screen, no. I'll have to find that out so I can show these. Two. Oh, there it is, show all the windows. Now that's showing the devices and I don't want that one. So now how do I get all the other windows that I want? Oh, here they go. Here we are. Now you all can see, uh, now you all can see uh, olive tree. Oh, that's online Bible. Sorry about that. Here's olive tree. Now you all can see what it looks like with one Bible open. And they have all kinds of helps that go with it that you can buy. And then if you're really serious, uh, then you'd want to get a program like uh, Lagos or Graham or uh, Accordance, uh, where over the years, you can get your whole Bible library on your computer. Here's Fourfold Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in parallel columns. Every incident in Jesus, all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are here in four columns. So I can look that up without any trouble. So rather than having two or three books on my bookshelf, which I have because I got them long before I could get a computer program, uh, and I was late coming to Lagos because I started out in Macs because the Macintosh I could do, I couldn't do uh, pre-Windows. I couldn't do, uh, uh, what was the database that, uh, window that uh, uh, Microsoft came out with first? Uh, I couldn't do that. It was far too complicated for me. But the Macintosh, which was all drop down Windows like Windows went to, I could use. So I went to Mac. Uh, and uh, Lagos didn't make a Mac version. <laughs> so I couldn't get to Lagos. And Accordance, which was the, which was the Laga, which was the main one, you had to put in several hundred dollars to start with. They didn't have a, a cheap version to start with. You had to be a serious scholar to want to do with it. Uh, and uh, when I started working with Seam, I had to start doing a lot of stuff with Windows because that's what we had there. Uh, and uh, when I bought my first Lagos, I bought it for my Mac that I still had. Uh, and then now they let me put it on both. So I can have one set of it, I can put it on my Mac and I can put it on a Windows program too. And when you buy it, you can put it on, I think, three different units. And they have an app that you can put on your phone. You get to nearly all the stuff on your phone, as well as having it on your computer. Uh, it works online. So every time you bring it up, it goes online to download any new stuff, any changes, updates, all that kind of stuff. But if you don't, if you can't be online, then you've got it on your computer. And you just open it there. Okay. Uh, find a word, uh, get a concordance, uh, or use one of these little Bible programs and ask it. And see, the advantage of the Bible program is 
not only do you not have only the phrase, and then you have to go look up the whole verse, and you have to write all that down, in your Bible program, it prints out the whole verse for you. And in most of these programs, in this one, for instance, you see, I can click on this, and it'll open that Bible version that I've had this in, it'll open that whole context for me. So I'm one click and I'm over here and I can see the whole paragraph that that verse was in. So I can make a judgment about the whole context, not just this particular verse. Does this verse really, is this a context? You know, uh, if I wanted, if I was looking up a word and I wanted to see all the ways that all the times it was used of God. Well, this, the text simply has the verse and it says, he did said whatever. Well, is that he God or not? I click on it once and I'm over in the context and I can see who the he is. So that's the, the advantage of the Bible program is you can do this kind of Bible study so much more quickly. And uh, in, uh, let me get back to the, uh, okay. Fine word. We'll see you all next week. They're ones you can use there in my library. If you don't have a Bible concordance, you're welcome to use either one of those two that she hasn't already taken. Uh, if you have a Strong's, then you're in then you're in good shape. Yeah. Then you're in good shape. And, and we'll see you all next week. Oh, there's the Stokes. You just listening? Could you hear? Okay, everybody's gone now but me. <laughs>